Hi, this is Dr. Max Fung, University of California, Davis in Sacramento, California. In this presentation on granulomatous dermatitis, I don't have any financial conflicts of interest, but I do have an interest in this textbook chapter that I wrote in that between the chapter and the presentation, there is some overlap in the cases that I'll be using, all being from my own personal teaching collection, unless otherwise noted. Granulomatous dermatitis is in fact one of the near dozen classic patterns of inflammatory skin disease. And among the itises, or specifically dermatitis, is perhaps more authentic than others in the, in the sense that it is truly a dermatitis with granulomatous changes and granulomas forming in the dermis. In contrast to, for example, spongiotic psoriasiform interface, the most distinctive changes are centered in the epidermis or the dermal epidermal junction. As discussed in my previous lecture on perivascular dermatitis, the least common denominator, if you will, for inflammation in the skin in the dermis are perivascular lymphocytes. But dermatopathologists will also often use the phrase lymphohistiocytic infiltrate to describe kind of nonspecific inflammation in the skin. And by the phrase lymphohistiocytic, we usually mean, speaking at least for myself, mostly lymphocytes, as was, would be expected, but also acknowledging the fact that a small number of inflammatory cells are also larger mononuclear cells that are presumably histiocytes or macrophages that are localized to the tissue. So what then is a granuloma? Well, in four words or less, I would say that it can be defined as a discrete aggregate of histiocytes. Compared to lymphocytes, which are relatively small with round hyperchromatic nuclei and scant or inapparent cytoplasm, histiocytes are much larger. In fact, sometimes they're quite large and resemble keratinocytes. So when histiocytes form granulomas, the term epithelioid histiocyte is often used. So relatively abundant cytoplasm, and in addition, the nucleus is relatively large. So we can see here a lymphocyte off to the side here, and by comparison, we have the relatively large pale or vesicular histiocyte nucleus, often with a visible nucleolus and very abundant cytoplasm. And another characteristic of histiocytes, at least in granulomatous inflammation, is the presence of multinucleation. So we may see two or three or even dozens or more nuclei within a multinucleated histiocyte. In contrast to granuloma, the term granulomatous is slightly less strict. A discrete aggregate of histiocytes is not required, but as a basic rule of thumb, an infiltrate that contains more or less 50% or more histiocytes may be characterized as granulomatous. So hopefully it's clear in an image like this that histiocytes outnumber lymphocytes. And these large, presumably activated histiocytes can be termed epithelioid histiocytes, especially when participating in granuloma formation. And here they are side by side, granulomatous, granuloma, and lymphohistiocytic. The discrete granuloma being a subset of granulomatous inflammation. Typically more than one granuloma can be seen. Now, I would say that probably on at least 99 out of 100 days that I get up in the morning, I'm very thankful that I'm a doctor, not a pop star. Not that I had any real choice in that matter, but back in the day when I, I was the age of a typical pop star, early mid-20s, I did make a choice that in retrospect was critical to my own career pathway when I decided to spend a summer in the lab of former chair of dermatology, Dr. Bill Epstein, after my first year of medical school at UCSF, the late Dr. Bill Epstein and his longtime collaborator, Kimi Fukuyama, where I first learned what the heck a granuloma was. We isolated proteins from schistosoma eggs and induced granulomas in a murine model. And it seemed cutting edge at the time, uh, rather primitive by modern standards. It's been nearly 30 years, and I don't think the work has received many citations. It no longer seems to be an active area of research. But the fundamental concept, concepts about granulomas that I learned then still seem to be fundamentally true to this day, albeit with a substantially richer or perhaps more granular understanding of granuloma formation.
And yet, over 200 years after the first description of the granuloma in tuberculosis, its definition remains primarily a histologic one. Granulomas are regarded to be a response to a poorly soluble or at least poorly degraded antigen, in many cases a pathogen, not only schistosoma, but in particular many mycobacteria and fungi induce a granulomatous reaction. In addition, exogenous substances as well as even one's own hair shaft upon follicular rupture commonly induce a granulomatous reaction. And then there are also a group of idiopathic granulomatous disorders, the prototype being sarcoid. Trying to explain a granuloma in lay terms, a scene such as this comes to mind after my wife prevailed upon me to watch all 54 episodes of Long Ya Bang, or in English, Nirvana in Fire. Here in episode 20, we have the soldiers playing the histiocytes, many wielding weapons that can represent T cells and cytokines, walling off a small number of very talented but elusive antigens in the center. Whether these antigens are heroes or enemies or even needlessly attracting unnecessary attention is beside the point. The point being that what at first glance might appear to be a somewhat inactive situation or stalemate is in fact a tense standoff with any eventual outcome depending on the dynamic and coordinated efforts against these very calm, stoic, and uncomplaining antigens by the histiocytes, lymphocytes, and pro- and anti-inflammatory cytokines, etc., determined to destroy or at least contain them. Now, leaving 6th century China for the modern 21st century worldwide, I would have to assume that granulomatous dermatitis looked more or less the same, controlling for skin type, of course, and compared to more superficial forms of dermatitis, such as spongiotic dermatitis, granulomatous dermatitis consistently has a deeper, thicker, or more indurated appearance, and this reflects the dermal and sometimes subcutaneous, subcutaneous localization to the granulomas. So many granulomatous papules or plaques are smooth on the surface, and as shown in this larger central plaque on the lower right, there can be some secondary epidermal changes such as hyperkeratosis. Experienced trainees, please offer a clinical diagnosis, but we'll come back to this case in a minute. Histologically, granulomas may be subdivided into four main groups, and we'll also address the interstitial granulomatous reactions, which do not exhibit discrete granulomas, but still exhibit a histiocyte predominant infiltrate. A brief note of clarification is that the term suppurative refers to a neutrophilic infiltrate. So I remember that when I was a resident, a typical phrase that was used to describe these reactions was suppurative and granulomatous or neutrophilic and granulomatous. So these are all synonymous reactions that is classified here as the suppurative granuloma. But let's start with the historical prototype, the tuberculoid granuloma, of course, so named for its characteristic presence in tuberculosis. And histologically, tuberculoid granulomas are characterized by discrete nodules of histiocytes, or at least predominantly histiocytes, but typically many associated lymphocytes. So there's lots of little lymphocytes within and around the periphery of the granuloma. A second major attribute of the tuberculoid granuloma is the presence of central caseation necrosis. So here's the granuloma, and the caseous necrosis is this central amorphous eosinophilic material. And um, this is so named after casein, a protein present in cheese. And typically that's more of a white crumbly material. So this is actually referring to the gross appearance of the tuberculoid granuloma, not the microscopic appearance. So, so the cheese is neither pink nor, nor yellow like this epoise that I'm showing here. But the idea is that there's kind of this mushy necrosis in the center, mixture of dead cells and presumably pathogens or antigens. Also typically present are multinucleated histiocytes known as Longhans giant cells with a characteristic peripheral or horseshoe-shaped arrangement of the nuclei. 
Although the long Hans giant cell was first described in tuberculosis, it's by no means specific, having been described in many other types of infection, as well as sarcoid, among others. So within the world of granulomas, it's really not at all diagnostically specific. Perhaps the most practical point is simply not to confuse long Hans with Dr. Langer Hans. Both German pathologists who lived in the 19th century, both with significant but mutually exclusive contributions to pathology and medicine. And as goes the differential diagnosis for long Hans giant cells, so goes the differential for tuberculoid granulomas, so not just tuberculosis, but a wide variety of infections, particularly mycobacteria and fungi, but many others, as well as other disorders that are not considered to be primary infections, such as rosacea. Now, the dermatologists know that nobody ever biopsies the erythematous telangiectatic or even papulopustular stage of rosacea, but occasionally a pustule will be biopsied and it could show ruptured folliculitis with granulomatous inflammation. But granulomatous rosacea does show a distinctive pattern of perifollicular granulomas. A closely related perioral dermatitis or sometimes periorificial dermatitis also has a granulomatous variant that shows essentially the histopathology of granulomatous rosacea with perifollicular granulomas. And finally, some rare but very severe acneiform eruptions that are regarded to be severe expressions of rosacea, including rosacea fulminans, pyoderma faciale, and lupus miliaris disseminatus facii, which has been associated with very distinctive, if not pathognomonic, histopathologic features in the correct clinical context, of course. So very prominent central caseation necrosis and also what can be reasonably described as a palisaded arrangement to the histiocytes in the periphery or outline of the granuloma. But here I would uh, recommend a little bit of caution because we're, we're getting into a little bit of overlap between the different types of granuloma. So we'll talk about the palisaded granulomas in just a few minutes. Those typically are not infectious diseases, whereas the appearance and phrase caseation necrosis is typically associated with tuberculoid granulomas and infections. Granulomatous rosacea is characterized by a perifollicular distribution of the granulomatous infiltrate. So we have hair follicles here and we have folliculocentric infiltrates. And we can see that it's granulomatous because it's relatively pale compared to what a diffuse lymphocytic infiltrate would look like. So we have lots of little lymphocytes here but then we also have more predominant areas with pale cells consistent with predominant histiocytes, i.e. granulomatous inflammation. Acneiform disorders such as rosacea represent a form of folliculitis. And so in some sections, we can see hair shafts and collections of neutrophils within the follicular epithelium diagnostic of folliculitis, but we can also presume that there's sufficient inflammation to rupture the follicular epithelium and induce a granulomatous response. So peripheral to the hair follicle, we can see a granulomatous reaction, a perifollicular granuloma. Also right here, some histiocytes amidst the neutrophils. So even though we don't see the ruptured epithelium in this particular section, we can presume that follicular rupture has occurred. And we can also see that the neutrophilic granulomatous response are really just two stages of a continuum of inflammation with neutrophils predominating, predominating in the acute stage and granulomatous inflammation in the chronic stage. Here's one for the pediatric dermatologists, experienced trainees, please pause and diagnose, chief residents in particular, in the photomicrographs, we have granulomatous inflammation with scattered lymphocytes. The black arrow is also pointing towards a neutrophil. There might be some eosinophils as well. So we have granulomas with a number of other inflammatory cells. So this could be classified as either a tuberculoid or suppurative granuloma. We need not see caseation necrosis to, to classify it as such. These are examples of idiopathic aseptic facial granuloma. 
which is regarded as a unique expression of childhood rosacea with one or a small number of inflammatory nodules, fortunately self-limited. These images courtesy of international colleagues and their publishers. The superative granulomatous reactions have some overlap with the tuberculoid granulomas in that both may be seen in infection and also acneiform disorders. In addition, follicular rupture is probably the single most common cause of superative granulomatous dermatitis in the routine practice of dermatopathology. Ruptured and inflamed epidermal inclusion cysts leave little fragments of orthokeratotic debris that invoke a foreign body granulomatous reaction, so-called cornflakes or potato chips. And one can make a diagnosis of a ruptured epidermal inclusion cyst even without seeing the cyst wall itself. And the main differential would include infection and possibly other foreign bodies. One of the more obvious causes of a granulomatous reaction would be a foreign body readily identifiable on H&E, such as plant material, with its characteristic organization and thick cell walls. In this example of a, a splinter or toothpick injury, we can see the plant material and then the surrounding granulomatous reaction with very prominent multinucleated histiocytes, including some large classic foreign body type giant cells. The foreign body granuloma is not one of the four histologic types of granulomas that I'm covering, but the phrase is often used because the causes are, as my 10-year-old daughter would say, obvi. And if it's not so obvious, there are at least some things that one can do microscopically. So the foreign body granulomas are associated with the so-called foreign body type giant cell, which is a very large multinucleated cell with the nuclei in haphazard array. This is in distinction from the more organized peripheral or horseshoe shaped array of the Longhans giant cell. And then secondly, always examine granulomatous dermatitis under polarized light, and this will highlight any birefringent foreign material. In the world of exogenous foreign materials, some are identified by polarized light, i.e. birefringent, and some are not. So probably the most commonly encountered birefringent material is just suture material. So you can see this in routine excision specimens. And then in terms of non-birefringent material, um, you basically need clinical correlation to identify these unless you have a characteristic appearance, one of which is the Swiss cheese pattern, which is many empty round spaces in formal and fixed tissue specimens historically attributed most likely to either paraffin or more recently silicone, including liquid silicone. So here's one such example of the Swiss cheese pattern and we can see lots of empty round holes. The actual material is lost during tissue processing, so we can't really tell what it is without getting a clinical history. In this case, paraffinoma, although without the history, the histologic differential diagnosis includes siliconoma. This is another example of such a Swiss cheese reaction, but notice that it doesn't look exactly like Swiss cheese, or at least not Emmental. The vacuoles are a bit smaller and it's admixed with kind of a granular foamy cytoplasm that to me is most vaguely reminiscent of the hibernomas that we discussed in the soft tissue lipomatous tumor lecture. And so for experienced and motivated trainees to make this diagnosis, I offer you two clues. The first is that this finding was present in a blepharoplasty specimen. And the second is that part of me will I date myself with a movie that made an impression on me, but it's related to the diagnosis as well. And so liquid silicone is, according to online sources, marketed as collagen in other countries, other markets. And in fact, the history with this patient was that they had in fact received what they were told was a collagen injection in another country. And so our diagnosis was subclinical extravasation of liquid silicone into the blepharoplasty specimen. And I recall at the time now looking at this image that I hadn't made this diagnosis before or seen this history before. So I did post this image on the Dermatopathology, the Dermpath Listserv 
run by Dr. Satay Hamza from Winnipeg, Canada, and Dr. Jag Bawan, dermatopathologist extraordinaire and longtime director of Dermpath at Boston University, kindly responded in the affirmative and, and uh, provided some much appreciated diagnostic confirmation. So if you're out there, Jag, many thanks. Granulomatous reactions associated with injected bovine collagen can be quite subtle, as you would expect. So the bovine collagen, the human collagen, not readily distinguishable, but there is an area here and a very sparse granulomatous host response, including a diagnostically nonspecific long Hans type giant cell. And as both historians, patients, and practitioners of cosmetic dermatology know, the bovine collagen was just the first chapter in the thriving history of filler substances, and each have their distinctive appearances. We don't really see bovine collagen much anymore with the advent of hyaluronic acid and a variety of other substances, both current and historical, that are shown in nice review articles, such as this one by Dr. Luis Requena and colleagues. Endogenous foreign material include gout and associated granulomatous inflammation. Large deposits of cholesterol clefts have a sheaf-like appearance. And again, that relatively common keratin granuloma with the potato chip or cornflake orthokeratotic fragments indicative of a ruptured epidermal inclusion cyst. And now we return to the clinical images that I showed earlier of a granulomatous dermatitis. I'll show you a couple more examples of this entity. Mostly smooth, indurated papules and plaques, but also notice the hypopigmented macules in the upper right image. Experienced dermatologists pause and diagnose. One might not always be right, but you can almost never go wrong, suggesting sarcoid. In many respects, the sarcoidal granuloma is the opposite of the tuberculoid granuloma. Both are granulomas, being discrete aggregates of histiocytes, but sarcoidal granulomas are lymphocyte poor, so called naked granulomas, and they lack the central caseation necrosis. Therefore, they are also designated non-caseating granulomas, typically, typically composed of enlarged activated epithelioid histiocytes and often containing long Hans giant cells. But remember, those are not diagnostically specific. What is a bit more specific is this structure. Experienced trainees, please diagnose. So this is indeed the asteroid body, one of the two so-called sarcoid bodies that are microscopic features characteristically associated with sarcoid. But as you can see in the yellow box, that of course is not completely specific. Sarcoid typically is at the top of the list, however. As a teenager in the United States in the 1980s, having just a few quarters in my pocket made asteroids quite fun. Of course, for patients suffering with sarcoid, the asteroid body is a histologic marker of the disease, and they can be extracellular or intracellular. In sarcoid, they are intracellular and thought to represent collagen and or vimentin intermediate filaments. The second of the so-called sarcoid bodies is the Schaumann body, named after Dr. Schaumann, a Swedish dermatologist, although the sources that I've read indicate that the Schaumann body was first described by Dr. von Schuppel, a German pathologist. And this is a calcified multinucleated histiocyte in multiple images shown here, courtesy of Dr. Yale Rosen of Long Island, New York, who also kindly uploaded the images of the asteroid bodies on the previous slide. In reality, the histopathologic spectrum can stray quite a bit from the classic sarcoidal granuloma that I've just described. So, for example, the presence of a foreign body does not exclude sarcoid, their so-called scar sar sarcoid. One may see tuberculoid features with many lymphocytes, caseation necrosis, as well as interstitial granulomatous changes and lichenoid reactions associated with granulomas abutting epithelium. And there was a nice study published by Dr. Nigel Ball and colleagues exemplifying what we see time and time again in pathology which is that one disease can have many histopathologic features. And here's one example of somewhat atypical histopathology and clinically confirmed sarcoid. We have hair follicle epithelium whose interface with the dermis is obscured by a somewhat dense or lichenoid 
granulomatous infiltrate. Note, however, that the granuloma itself does have a sarcoidal quality in that it's mostly large epithelioid histiocytes and very sparse lymphocytes, so-called naked granuloma. And here's one more example. We can see that this is more of a subcutaneous granulomatous infiltrate, and I'm going to draw your attention to this little rim of lymphocytes associated with the granulomas. So by panoramic view, one might suspect a tuberculoid granuloma, but this is subcutaneous sarcoid, clinically confirmed. What is the dermatologist's diagnosis for this annular eruption? This one happens to be annular sarcoid. How about this one? Biopsies for these cases showed the much more commonly encountered granuloma annulare, the prototype of the palisading granulomatous dermatitis. The palisaded granulomas are characterized by an annular rim of histiocytes, either complete or incomplete. And equally helpful are the stromal changes in the center of the palisade in which there's a relative loss of cell nuclei, but a prominence of one or more stromal alterations, necrobiotic or degenerated collagen, mucin, and or fibrin. Among the four histologic subtypes of granuloma, I find that the palisaded is the most difficult for beginning learners of the subject to grasp. More often than not, that annular rim of histiocytes is subtle or incomplete or irregular, probably best appreciated from scanning magnification or panoramic view at low magnification. The uh, closer one gets, the higher magnification one gets, the greater the tendency to lose the forest for the trees, if you will. They still are true granulomas, though, in that they are discrete, albeit subtle, aggregates of histiocytes. In granuloma annulare, the center of the palisaded granuloma contains degenerating or necrobiotic collagen, which has a slightly altered appearance. It's still eosinophilic, but the normal, regular fibrillary quality of the collagen is altered. It looks kind of chewed up, if you will. Mucin is also typically increased in the center of the palisade in granuloma annulare, and this has more of a pale basophilic appearance admixed with the necrobiotic collagen. So the first step is to recognize the palisaded granuloma. And in this example, the interstitial mucin is relatively prominent. Here's the palisade. And here are some small kind of chewed up ratty looking collagen fibers in the center of the palisade that represent the necrobiotic collagen, as well as pale basophilic interstitial mucin in the center of the palisade. The mucin appears as a pale, kind of delicate, blue basophilic material in between the necrobiotic collagen fibers. Beware this notorious distractor for the uninitiated. The presence of perivascular lymphocytes surrounding the palisaded granulomas is expected and often is the one thing that trainees clue in on if they don't notice the palisaded granuloma. So that was the palisaded, and I would say classic variant of granuloma annulare. But if that wasn't subtle enough, the other histologic variant of granuloma annulare is the interstitial or so-called incomplete variant, where we simply have increased histiocytes. So it fulfills the definition for granulomatous, but we may not actually see discrete granulomas, not necessarily any palisaded granulomas at all. So we get into the differential diagnosis of the so-called busy or cellular dermis, where we think about interstitial GA in a differential diagnosis with a sparsely cellular dermatofibroma, early Kaposi sarcoma, and then sometimes we add the late stage of leukocytoclastic vasculitis, where we see a busy dermis without neutrophils. And along the lines of neutrophils and vasculitis, you can occasionally see them in granuloma annulare. Typically, however, plasma cells are absent or not prominent. No particular rules about eosinophils for granuloma annulare, but they're usually not prominent. One example of a somewhat busy cellular dermis with many histiocytes, as well as neutrophils and an occasional eosinophil in GA. And in fact, 
interstitial granuloma annulare is just the entry point into an entire differential diagnosis of interstitial granulomatous disorders. And so we don't really have time to go through all of these today, but I'm putting out a bunch of names and you can see how they're classified with some of the major forms of interstitial granulomatous dermatitis, including interstitial GA, but also actinic granuloma as the prototype, if you will, of the elastolytic granulomas, and then also reactive granulomatous dermatitis, which is, I believe, the newest name or heading proposed for a long list of very long names that are difficult for many people to remember. And then, of course, don't forget the neoplasms of the cells that make the inflammatory skin disorders. Uh, mycosis fungoides also has an interstitial granulomatous variant, as well as a granulomatous slox skin variant. And so with that as an introduction or hint, experienced clinicians, please pause and diagnose. I think this image shows the photo distribution best of this patient's generalized eruption of actinic granuloma, which exhibits quite a bit of clinical as well as histologic overlap with granuloma annulare, hence the controversy as to whether it should be separated or distinct. But most histopathologists have identified somewhat distinctive features with actinic granuloma summarized on this slide. So actinic granuloma occurs on skin with significant solar elastosis, resulting in elastophagocytosis. Sometimes people use the term elastoclasis, which I think is the same thing. Overall, the pattern of the infiltrate tends to be more interstitial rather than palisaded, but of course, both can be seen as, as is true for granuloma annulare. Overall, there's a tendency for more prominent multinucleated giant cells and a tendency to lack an increase in mucin. And although plasma cells are not typically present in granuloma annulare, they have been reported more frequently in actinic granuloma. And so it probably seems somewhat obvious that these differences are more or less shades of gray. And so I would expect any listener to be skeptical about the validity of distinguishing actinic granuloma from GA. And so I'm going to take a few extra minutes to delve a little bit deeper, look a little bit at some primary data, starting with this study by a dermatopathologist that I met a long time ago in San Francisco and whose scholarship and collegiality I have great respect for, Dr. Richard Crawford from Vancouver and colleagues. And so here is some original data from this series, looking first at the multinucleated giant cells present in 100% of actinic granuloma, but overall present in not quite 50% of the GA cases, both on sun-damaged and non-sun-damaged skin. Mucin absent in most cases of actinic granuloma and prominent in zero cases, in contrast to the situation with granuloma annulare. And finally, the palisaded pattern. So not present in any of the cases of actinic granuloma, but as would be expected, present in most cases of granuloma annulare. And so these findings by Crawford and colleagues are more or less in line with my own anecdotal experience. But in terms of resolving the larger question of the status of actinic granuloma, it still proved difficult. Clinicians have not been shown to be able to reliably distinguish actinic granuloma from granuloma annulare occurring on sun-damaged skin. And so if one looks to histology, I've shown you some evidence to support the trends and differences between the two entities, but looking into the broader literature, it's still not that clear cut. I, I held out some hope for the status of the palisaded granulomas because in some of the largest series published, two of them listed here, palisaded granulomas were not found at all in actinic granuloma. However, if one looks at other publications, including some of the more recent ones, uh, palisaded granulomas are clearly described in their cases of actinic granuloma. So at the present time, I think the jury is still out. But that by no means precludes us from taking a look at one or two typical histologic examples. So here we see a nodular infiltrate with some pale areas consistent with granulomatous inflammation as well as some 
associated lymphocytes. We do not see any overt palisading. And with actinic granuloma, what we want to see is that elastoclasis or elastophagocytosis, a multinucleated histiocyte with a solar elastotic fiber in its cytoplasm. Here's another example with an interstitial histiocytic infiltrate, many histiocytes. And the more you look, the more you find. We can find these little gray elastotic fibers within the cytoplasm of these histiocytes. The more you look, the more you find. Now, no one believes that elastophagocytosis in and of itself is a specific histopathologic feature. We see it all the time on sun damaged skin that's inflamed, just routine basal cell carcinoma excisions. So no one thinks that that's specific. But the specific concept of pathogenesis with actinic granuloma is that it is, in fact, the trigger for that particular entity. So the solar elastosis is the trigger. And if one has a nice large specimen, one can actually demonstrate the loss of elastic fibers in the kind of central area, kind of the wake of the advancing edge of granulomatous inflammation at the periphery of the lesion. And so this is really the only example that I have to show because I do not routinely order elastic tissue stains on these cases. But in this case, the uh, specimen was submitted as actinic granuloma. Please confirm, please order elastic tissue stains by the late Dr. Haynes Ely. And so naturally I obliged. But we can see that there's severe solar elastosis that's highlighted by the EVG stain. We have the interstitial granulomatous infiltrate off to the side. And I think this area here that is more kind of fibrovascular with very, very subtle interstitial granulomatous inflammation is probably the center of the lesion. And so we do in fact see somewhat less elastic tissue in the center here as one might see with fibrosis and scarring as opposed to the advancing edge of the lesion where the granulomatous infiltrates are most prominent. So that's the idea with actinic granuloma. Looking at the broader differential diagnosis of interstitial granulomatous reactions, I remember we have interstitial variant of GA. We just talked about actinic granuloma. And then we have a variety of other disorders uh, that have long and confusing names, hard to remember, but most recently proposed is the relatively simple term, reactive granulomatous dermatitis. And this encompasses lots of older historical terms, including palisaded neutrophilic and granulomatous dermatitis, which is typically associated with connective tissue disorders, sometimes drug reactions. We have the interstitial granulomatous dermatitis, or IGD, also associated with connective tissue disease or drug reactions. And then we have just the straight up interstitial granulomatous drug reaction, all being unified under this heading of reactive granulomatous dermatitis. And in general, there aren't really distinctive features. Of course, if we see eosinophils, we like to think about an interstitial granulomatous drug reaction. And as the name suggests, if you have prominent palisades and neutrophils and leukocytoplastic vasculitis to boot, then one can specifically go for this subset of palisaded neutrophilic and granulomatous dermatitis. But other than that, I don't really have a whole lot of clues. The only one clue that I'm going to leave you with here is that uh, in contrast with interstitial granulomatous GA, interstitial GA, typically there are no epidermal uh, alterations in GA, with the exception of perforating GA, of course. But otherwise, you don't expect to see any epidermal changes. So if you have an interstitial granulomatous reaction and you see a little bit of epidermal alteration, be it spongiosis or interface changes or even both, that would be one of the histologic clues to consider this group of reactive granulomas dermatitis rather than just the more commonly encountered granuloma annulare. Okay, quiz time. Trainees, please pause and diagnose. So the clinically proven diagnosis is sarcoid, but to be honest, depending on what you were thinking and in real life, none of these answers are necessarily wrong. But let's take a look and we have a collection of discrete aggregates of histiocytes. There's no caseation in the center, so they're kind of epithelioid granulomas. 
non-caseating, and so that's good for sarcoidal granuloma. This one appears to have varying degrees of lymphocytes, so depending on what your tolerance for the lymphocytes is, you could go for tuberculoid granuloma, because you don't necessarily need caseation necrosis to make it a tuberculoid granuloma. But remember, sarcoid can have quite a protein spectrum, including caseating tuberculoid granulomas. So the lymphocytes, although it would be nice if they were a little bit sparser, uh, in no way preclude the diagnosis. And I think least, least uh, good would be the other answers. So foreign body granuloma uh, usually has, at least on a test question, it would have a foreign body in the middle, but um, you can have a sarcoidal foreign body granuloma reaction, so it's not impossible. Likewise, granuloma annulare, I mentioned the palisaded and interstitial variants. There is a rare a kind of case report level sarcoidal variant of granuloma annulare, so even that, even that's not impossible. But for uh, basic testing purposes, sarcoid first, and then maybe a little bit of a tuberculoid element. Next case, trainees, pause, and diagnose. In the derm path world, this is one of the classic food analogies. And I personally tend to like my appetizers over my desserts, so I'm throwing in some variety here. But however you see it, the concept here is to see the layers. It's hard to get away from this one, even in a pandemic, as long as you have a smartphone. It's everywhere. Necrobiosis lipoidica, formerly known as Necrobiosis lipoidica diabeticorum, NLD. Necrobiosis lipoidica is often compared to granuloma annulare, with which it often shares a differential diagnosis. In contrast to the more patchy focal involvement in GA, necrobiosis lipoidica tends to have more of a diffuse and deep full thickness or pander pandermal involvement, creating that layer cake appearance of necrobiotic collagen and associated inflammation. We're still in the differential of the palisaded granulomatous dermatitis, but with necrobiosis lipoidica, the palisades tend to be more horizontally oriented or flattened and parallel to the epidermal surface and often incomplete or open-ended. Plasma cells are quite common and distinctive, and mucin tends to be minimal to absent. Probably more the exception than the rule that we get such large, beautiful incisional biopsies like this one. More commonly encountered and still perfectly acceptable in most cases is a good-sized punch biopsy. Palisaded granulomas, flattened and horizontally oriented, and frequently incomplete or open-ended, requiring a bit of interpolation. Please, your diagnosis, please. Necrobiotic xanthogranuloma, NXG, is typically the next entity discussed after necrobiosis lipoidica in the differential diagnosis of granulomatous dermatitis, palisaded granulomatous dermatitis, although it can be regarded as a histiocytosis of non langerhans cell origin in recognition of its distinctive syndromic features with paraproteinemia. But from a histopathologic point of view, it does look quite similar, sometimes identical to necrobiosis lipoidica with two very distinctive features, the presence of cholesterol clefts and Teuton giant cells. So in necrobiotic xanthogranuloma, NXG, we often see the same panoramic profile as we do in necrobiosis lipoidica with that layer cake pattern of pandermal sclerosis and granulomatous inflammation. The characteristic difference would be these sheaf-shaped clefts that represent the artifact from cholesterol clefts. Now, truth be told, cholesterol clefts have been documented in necrobiosis lipoidica, but in terms of what's a hallmark of disease, cholesterol clefts are a hallmark of necrobiotic xanthogranuloma. The second distinctive feature in necrobiotic xanthogranuloma is the Teuton giant cell and its precursor, the foamy histiocyte. So the Teuton giant cell shown here looks like a Longhans giant cell with a wreath or horseshoe shaped arrangement of the nuclei. But in addition, there is a periphery of foamy cytoplasm 
Rheumatoid nodule is the last of the palisaded granulomatous reactions that we'll discuss today, and in fact, the last entity that we'll discuss. Typically occurs as deep, often subcutaneous granulomas involving the elbow or finger joints in patients with established rheumatoid arthritis. In the panoramic view at low magnification, we can see that there's no epidermis or superficial dermis to speak of. Rather, what we have are these large irregular palisaded granulomas with a fair amount of fairly bright pink material in the center of the palisades, and that would be consistent with the fibrin that's a hallmark of the rheumatoid nodule. And so fibrin probably most closely resembles the necrobiotic collagen. Both are pink or eosinophilic in contrast to the basophilic color of the mucin. But fibrin typically has a little bit more of a homogeneous, liquefied, amorphous appearance as opposed to necrobiotic collagen, which at least in most cases, one can still make out a little bit of that fibrillary quality of collagen, albeit a bit chewed up. In addition to being relatively large and deep, rheumatoid nodules are also characteristic for having a fairly well-organized palisade of histiocytes, as shown here in this image and case courtesy Dr. Luis Ricana. We can follow, even from low magnification, a pretty sharply demarcated outline of the palisade of histiocytes in this rheumatoid nodule. And moreover, look how large and kind of irregular and coalescent or confluent these granulomas are, these palisaded granulomas. That's fairly characteristic of the rheumatoid nodule, in addition to the bright eosinophilic fibrin in the centers of the palisades. Note that there also is some variable basophilia as well. So that could be mucin or could be cellular debris. We would have to look closer to determine that. And that rounds out our differential diagnosis for the palisaded granulomatous dermatitis. And once again, I certainly do not need to verify if you are human, but I would like to verify that you're understanding the different granuloma types, especially before we start the interactive session in the next hour. So which of these two images is the palisaded and which is the tuberculoid granuloma? So here's the answer. But in my experience, it's not necessarily that easy. I, for one, have definitely been fooled on this differential. With tuberculoid granulomas, remember we expect to see a lot of lymphocytes. So we have a lot of lymphocytes surrounding this granuloma with some central caseous necrosis. But depending on how prominent that caseation necrosis is, it can create the appearance of a palisade of histiocytes around the edge. But in a true palisaded granulomatous dermatitis, we wanna see a more orderly arrangement of histiocytes and we want to see some altered stroma in the middle. In this case, I can see a little bit of that fibrillary quality of the eosinophilic fibers, so that would be most consistent with necrobiotic collagen. In other instances, the center of a palisaded granuloma may have more apparent mucin. And two final summary slides.